grammar. That should be different. Um, this actually starts on page 316 of the 2020 official study guide, SAT study guide from College Board, page 316. And what I want to show you is just some basic rules, just as the reading section and the math section kind of use the same types of questions over and over again, and all they're doing is changing the actual story. Uh, this actually is the same thing. They're kind of, what from what I've seen over the last few years, is they're kind of using some of the same rules over and over. So the more you practice with some of the rules, uh, the more you'll just fly through this section. Of course, in this section, you only have 35 minutes for 44 questions. And as much as I want to tell you that you can skim through and get through this really easily, I will show you some of the questions that will change your mind about that. And you actually do have to read the entire thing as much as I wish we didn't have to, but we do have to read and um, as we're reading. So we're going to kind of lose all the strategies that we, that we had for reading. We're not reading for a theme anymore. We're really, as we're reading, we're actively reading and thinking about the grammar rules that that are in play and what is the correct way to change it while we're reading. And that's going to, that's, if you're fixing the grammar while you're reading, that's the best way to save time. And again, even though maybe you haven't had a grammar, you know, proper grammar instruction in a few years, some of these are just the same rules over and over again. So you'll see exactly what I mean after this, uh, this first grammar section. And then of course we have plenty of time to study more grammar if you need it. Um, so we'll start right here, page 316. And, um, what I'm going to do is just the same way of studying. I'm going to read it out loud. Uh, you'll read with me and um, I'm going to pause at different places. I have some notes written down to remind myself to pause at different places and show you what the grammar rule is for that. And uh, then you'll start seeing the repetition, even in as short a passage as this 44 questions, you'll start seeing the repetition. Um, so the one thing that I do want to bring your attention to just in the directions. Well, I'll just read it now because then you will never read it again because these directions aren't going to help you. But I do want to bring up the point that there are still graphs and tables um, in the grammar section. So each passage below is accompanied by a number of questions. For some questions, you will consider how the passage might be revised to improve the expression of ideas. For other questions, you'll consider how the passage might be edited to correct errors in sentence structure, usage, or punctuation. A passage or a question may be accompanied by one or more graphics, such as a table or a graph. And the reason why I'm bringing that to your attention now is there's a, probably only two questions where you do have to, um, you know, go to the table or the graph, but I'm teaching you to, uh, you know, kind of, uh, you know, do the grammar while you're reading. And so when you, uh, you do have to like kind of shift, uh, that, you know, there's a little shift in your, in your mind when you do get to the table or the graph They're again, they're the easier questions, but, uh, it is, you know, it's a little bit different. So I just wanted to bring that to your attention and, um, you're making revising and editing and those revising and editing details, unfortunately, those are the ones that keep you from being able to skim this entire passage. Some questions will direct you to an underlined portion of a passage. Other questions will direct you to a location in a passage or ask you to think about the passage as a whole. After reading each passage, choose the answer to each question that most effectively improves the quality of writing in the passage or what makes the passage conform to the conventions of standard written English. Conventions, conventions, conventions. You haven't seen that in a little while, I bet, but um, let's go. Questions 1 through 11 are based on the following passage. So again, I'm just going to read this. And while I'm reading, I'll be marking as always and stopping and just telling you what the rule is and what the correct answer is. So please just read along with me. That's the best thing to do. How the cat and hat changed children's education. In a 1954 Life magazine article, author John Hershey expressed concern that children in the United States were disengaged from learning how to read. Among other problems, Hershey noted, the reading material available to grade schoolers had a hard time competing with television, radio, and other media for children's attention. 
So automatically what's happening in my mind is I'm looking here. They're going to tell me, is this conjunction correct with punctuation? I automatically am thinking that in my head. So I went back and double checked this conjunction and when it is like a list of three different things, you have to do comma, comma, comma. So three different things, comma, comma, comma. So the main thing that they were saying, Hershey noted the reading material available to grade schoolers had a hard time competing with television. There's the one thing. Radio, there's the second. And other media, that's the third. So this is just, you know, a punctuation question. Television, comma, radio, comma, and other media. And I'm going to double check up here. And what it's asking me is no change because I like that there's that comma and. So remember I said comma comma, television, comma, radio, comma, and other media for children's attention. Um, you do not need to change, put in anything else. And with other media, it's, there wasn't, it'd be with television, with radio and with, but there's no with radio, so it's not. And also and competing with, again, this is a punctuation question. So it's television comma, radio comma, and other media. So the answer is no change. So again, the rule is with a conjunction and, it's always going to be, you need, and there's three or more, you need a comma and. Interesting, since an individual sense of wholeness follows and cannot proceed a sense of accomplishment. Now this is interesting because it seems like we just jumped. Well, I did, I jumped. One solution he proposed was to make children's books more interesting since an individual's sense of wholeness follows and cannot proceed a sense of accomplishment. The writer wants to include a quotation with, by Hershey that supports the topic of the passage. So I'm going to think to myself already, the topic of the passage is just, he has to create a, a book that competes with television, radio, and other media for children's attention. The children books out there aren't out there, aren't doing it. So he has to create... So the writer wants to include a quotation by Hershey that supports the topic of the passage. So that's the topic of the passage so far as we know it, is that they're trying to create a children's book. Um, which choice best accomplishes this goal? I don't like what's in there. An individual sense of wholeness follows and cannot proceed a sense of accomplishment. That doesn't really tell us anything about the topic of the passage, so it's definitely not no change. Interesting, since learning starts with failure, the first failure is the beginning of education. Mm, that doesn't go with the topic. Interesting because journalism allows its readers to witness history. Fiction gives its readers an opportunity to live it. No, I don't like it. Interesting with drawings like those of the wonderfully imaginative geniuses among children illustrators. So D. The story of the Cat in the Hat's publication began when William Spaulding, comma, the director of the education division at the publishing company Hofton Mifflin, comma, read Hershey's article and had an idea. So as I'm thinking, I'm thinking the reason of this comma right here, the director of the education division at, and the publishing company of Hofton Mifflin, that's called an appositive. So they're giving us more information about William Spaulding. It's not information that we absolutely have to have in order to understand the, the, um, the reading, but the author wants us to know a little bit more about author Spalding. And so they do that in the positive way when William Spalding comma, and then this, this information about is about William Spalding, the director of education division at the publishing company, Hoff and Mifflin comma. Again, I could take this information out from the, all the way down to Hoff and Mifflin. And I could still read the sentence and it would make sense. The story of the Cat in the Hat's publication began when William Spaulding read Hershey's article and had an idea. That makes perfect sense. I took the positive out. But the, again, the author wants us to have that information. So let's have a look. I really don't think it's a change because I really think that now that I just explained to you what the positive is, it would mean comma, the director, 
so it's not that comma the director we don't know any more information so that comma right here is incorrect and then we'll get into the dashes in a minute but it's not a dash the dashes again um they do like dashes in here there's the n dash and the m dash but the dashes are essentially like a way to bring your attention to a little more information. However, the correct use of the dash in this sentence would have been a period, Spalding, dash, the director of the education division at, at publishing company Hoffman Mifflin. It would have been a period there. So the correct use is the positive because it's a comma. They're giving us more information. It's not bringing us our attention to the fact that he's the director and then the sentence continues on. So the positive was used correctly in this one. Spalding agreed that there was a need for appealing books for beginning readers, period. All right, what seems to be wrong there? Which choice most effectively combines the sentence and the underline portion? Okay, so beginning readers, so we're going to need a conjunction. If you remember what those conjunctions are from Schoolhouse Rock, you're going to need a conjunction to bring these two together or a piece of punctuation. So let's see. Spalding agreed that there was a need for appealing books for beginning readers. He thought he knew who should write one. And so let's see. A, readers, and he. I like that. And he thought he knew who should write one. Absolutely. Readers, comma, namely, he thought he knew who should write one. It's not the correct use of the dash. Readers, okay, so here's our first semicolon that we're meeting. In order for us to use a semicolon, that means that they have put a semicolon in a place in the sentence with two independent clauses, meaning they can stand on their own. Now, the interesting thing on this one is that... Um, and wherever you put the semicolon in in the sentence is where the sentence like is done there. The interesting thing in that in this one that I am thinking to myself is that there's a period in between these two, um, and so the semicolon might would work. However, they put a and spalding, meaning like the sentence was going to continue. Um, if they had left this and out a semicolon, then we know that this independent clause could stand on its own. Spalding agreed that there was a need for appealing books for beginning readers, semicolon. He thought he knew who should write one, period. That would actually be the better use of the semicolon. This adding the conjunction after the semicolon actually makes it incorrect. Readers, and meanwhile, he. Now, the one thing that I will tell you about SAT is they typically want to keep the sentences less wordy. So if I have to go between A, readers, and he, and meanwhile, he, I'm going to go with A. I'm going to go with the less wordy one. And as I told you as we were reading, all we kind of needed was a conjunction um, to bring those two together. And while I'm talking about conjunctions... If you remember this, this is just a quick and easy way to remember the conjunctions. And you typically want to pay attention to conjunctions because you normally do need a comma um, before a conjunction. So for and nor but or yet. So so these are just a quick list. There's more, but this is a quick, yeah, quick list. Fanboys. Um, so you definitely want to pay attention to those um, when we're putting together sentences. For and nor but or yet so. Having known Spalding for many years and having maintained a professional relationship with him, automatically I'm thinking, why are they having to have? Why are they having too many havings in that sentence? having known Spalding for many years, and which choice best supports the information that follows in the sentence. Giselle was an experienced writer and illustrator. Supports the information that follows the sentence. Giselle was an experienced writer and illustrator. Um... Uh, 
acquired a reputation for perfectionism and for setting high standards for his work. Experienced writer and illustrator. Acquired a reputation for per Ezel was an experienced writer. Having made him. So what we're looking for them for that for this is to support Kizel was an experienced writer and illustrator. Acquired a reputation for, for, for perfectionism and for setting high standards for his work. Okay, I mean that would mean an experienced writer and illustrator, so I'll keep it. Um, been interested in politics before breaking into the game of children's literature? No, that doesn't have anything to do with an experienced writer and illustrator. Published nine children's books and having received three nominations for the prestigious Caledet Method, that's an experienced writer and illustrator. So between these two, we're looking for the choice that best supports the information that follows in this underlined sentence, which was that he was an experienced writer and illustrator. We just need some information about Giselle. And so between B and D, um, I'm going to choose D. Okay, so here's the reason why I'm not choosing A. Giselle was an experienced writer and illustrator. This is information about Spalding having known Spalding for many years and having maintained a professional relationship with him, this isn't support for him being an experienced writer and illustrator. So if we go in, having published nine children's books and having received three nominations for the prestigious Caldelot Medal, Giselle was an experienced writer and illustrator. Yes, that's correct. Okay, so another thing that you do have to really pay attention to along with the um, the conventions and using um, for and nor but or yet so is the transitions. So if your 10th grade teacher hasn't really drilled into your head about what the transitions are, um, or maybe it was your ninth grade teacher, um, because oftentimes on standard state standardized tests, like your state standardized test, uh, that you are getting extra points on the writing section for understanding the conventions and transitions. So this is one example of understanding and demonstrating an understanding of the, you know, the, just which transition goes in. Uh, I'll post a link to a list of transitions. I don't think it's worth like memorizing because there are hundreds of lists of transitions out there. It just is worth knowing like a solid list of transitions um, so that you can very quickly understand what they're doing. Um, when I read number six, what I'm doing is um, when they say however, then I I think that the information that's coming after a however comma, and that's another thing, it's always got to be transition comma. Um, and, and that's the truth, even if a transition is mid-sentence but the transition comma this new project presented him with an obstacle however this new project presented him with an obstacle that like I'm not really thinking anything is wrong with that because however is like they're giving us like some alternative information for example this new project presented him with an obstacle we're not looking for examples yet in the in this uh, paragraph the paragraph's just begun and we're not looking for examples furthermore would mean that this is more of a struggle and we just in the first sentence determined that there's a relationship between the illustrator and the author so i don't like furthermore at any rate Again, another one that would, would kind of make us think like there was a lot of information that had come before. So I don't think any of those transitions work. I think however is perfect. However, this new project presented him with an obstacle. Spalding told Gazelle to write his entire book using a restricted vocabulary from an elementary school list of 348 words. Gazelle started two stories only to abandon them when he found that he needed to use words that were not on the list. On the verge of giving up, Gazelle's story finally hit upon an image that became its basis. Interesting. Now we're 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 going from words, you know, uh, you know, go, this list of words. Gazelle's story finally hit upon an image that became its basis: a cat wearing a battered stovepipe hat. Let's see. Um, yeah, I, I think I'm just looking at this. An image that Gazelle finally hit upon became the basis of his story, um, and I kind of. Um, I'm thinking like I want a little more introduction to, uh, you know, in, uh, 
the illustrator part of the story because here we're just going from vocabulary. So introduce me to like who the character is or what that um, illustration is going to look like. Now this, I don't like B and uh, if there, here's the next thing for you to really pay attention to is active and passive voice. Like for active voice, it is always a, um, a subject is doing something. It's not that it's being done to it. So the noun is doing the verb for active voice. So it would be the noun is doing the verb. This one um, on B, as I'm reading it, I'm kind of thinking like something's being done. An image that guys finally hits upon became the basis of his story. That is passive voice to me because it's not, um, you know, it, the noun is doing it. So I don't like B in an only, is that is passive voice. And I don't think that we would choose a passive voice on this one. Giselle, again, there's the noun finally hit upon the image that became the basis for his story. And then a colon, a cat wearing a battered stovepipe hat. I like that one. The story was finally based on an image that Giselle hit upon. Again, that's not necessarily like a, a, an active voice. That's more of a passive voice. So I don't like that one. And this is fine. Um, so let's talk a minute about the actual colon. It's um, placed in the sentence where it's going to then give us a little bit of information. Oftentimes people think that there's got to be a list afterwards. It doesn't have to be a list afterwards. Again, the colon and the dash are sometimes just um, here's a little more information. His main character established, Giselle commenced the difficult task of writing a book with a limited vocabulary. At the end of her duration, nine months long, the cat in the hat was complete. So what we want to do at the end of her duration, nine months long. Again, that's a little a passive voicer, you know, to me. Um, so let's, I don't like that. At the end of a duration of nine months long, it's a little wordy and I don't like the way that it's worded. The cat in the hat was complete. So let's just tap into as we're reading. So if I don't, if I say there's, it's not no change. What they're, all they're saying is nine months. After 36 weeks or nine months had passed, as I mentioned before, SAT wants it to be less wordy. That's six and one and half tons in another. And that's unnecessary. After a length of nine months had elapsed, that's saying the exact same thing that's already on there and it's not necessary. And nine months later, here, let's make it less wordy. Let's go with D. The book was a hit. Children were entertained by its plot about the antics of a mischievous cat and is captivated by its eye-catching illustrations and memorable rhythms and rhymes. All right, as, you, as I'm reading it, I'm sure you were saying, uh, -uh subject verb agreement. So um, we we're talking about a bunch of children they were entertained by its plot about the antics of a mischievous cat and is captivated. No. And so it's a bunch of children was captivated. That's still singular. So that's not right. And has been. So let's just delete that. They were entertained by its plot about the antics of a mischievous cat and captivated by its eye-catching illustrations and memorable rhymes. It would have to be were anyway, so that's not one of our options. So we're going to, you know, look, we're going to be matching these verbs. Children were entertained and were captivated. It's not one of our options, so we'll just get rid of it. Its sales inspired another publishing company, Random House, to establish a series for early readers called Beginner Books, which featured work by Gazelle and other writers, and other publishers quickly followed suit. In the years that follow, wait, that's a period. In the years that followed, that would have to be like a comma, right? Many talented writers and illustrators of children's books imitated Gazelle's formula of restrictive vocabulary, whimsical art. So why is that period there? That makes no sense at all. So um, it cannot be, as we mentioned before, uh, in the years that followed is not um, an independent clause. It doesn't have a subject. 
And so, and it doesn't have a complete dot. So it cannot be a semicolon because that in the years that followed is not a independent clause. It can't stand on its own. In the years that followed, comma, yes. Or in the years that followed, dash, many, but comma. In the years that followed, many talented writers The right, okay. But perhaps the best proof the Cat in the Hat's success is not its influence on other books, but its limited vocabulary and appealing word choices. The writer wants a conclusion that restates the main themes of the passage. Which choice best accomplishes this goal? As we remember, and we could we could look back, but we kind of don't have to. The main goal was just that um, this these people, these illustrator and writer, were challenged to come up with a book to keep children's attention because they were being distracted by things like the television. So the writer wants a conclusion that restates the main themes of the passage, which choice best accomplishes this goal. Although they are talking about limited vocabulary and appealing word choices, that wasn't the only thing that, you know, was the main theme. Um, so I, I would like to change the conclusion that restates the theme of the passage. Impressive worldwide sales that continue to remain high to this day. That doesn't, that's giving us more information on to the future. That doesn't tell us what the main theme was. Enduring ability to delight children and engage them in learning how to read. Yes, I really like that. Important role in the history of illustration in the 20th century. It actually wasn't mostly about that. It was mostly about enduring ability to delight children and engage them in learning how to read. All right, I know I went slow through that one, but now that, you know, we've kind of, we had an opportunity to go through, um, you know, some punctuation stuff, although we haven't seen the use of a dash yet in a correct way. So hopefully we'll get to that. Um, but so we've gone through some punctuation stuff. We went through um, transitions. We went through uh, semicolons. We went through um, a positives. Uh, we went through... Uh, transitions and so those are some of the things that we'll continue to go through and I won't have to like reiterate the rule because you already know it so now we could start to go a little bit faster so thanks for sticking with me all right I'm just reading questions 12 through 22 are based on the following passage keep student volunteering voluntary a growing number of public schools in the United States requires students to complete community service hours to graduate. Such volunteering, be it help at a local animal shelter, when they pick up litter, or working at a health care facility, have obvious benefits for the community it serves and teaches students important life skills. Okay, so I already, okay, I can see what's going on here. Such volunteering, be it helping at a local animal shelter, there's one, so that's why we have to have these commas. When they pick up litter, we already know that we're talking about the kids. So I kind of don't like that. Plus, when we're talking about verbs, we already had our first verb, and we have a list here now of different things that kids can do for volunteering. So such volunteering, be it helping at a local animal shelter, I would like it to say picking to match that verb, picking up litter. So there's the second in our list or working and there's the third on our list. So volunteering, picking, working at a healthcare facility has obvious benefits for the community it serves and teaches students important life skills. Let's see what the question is. Yeah. Um, comma to pick up litter that doesn't match the verbs that were already listed. Litter collection again or picking up litter. Um, when you're choosing these ones, I do keep my eye on the punctuation just to make sure that the one I'm correct, I'm picking. Uh, I like this one a lot because again, I mentioned we're matching the verbs. So it should be volunteering, picking and working. Um, but the punctuation is correct as well. So I'm definitely going to go with D on that one. But critics say that making volunteer volunteerism compulsory misses the point of the act. By its very definition, 
volunteer work is done willingly. The writer wants to transition from the previous paragraph that highlights the criticism of compulsory volunteer mentioned in the previous paragraph. Which choice best accomplishes this goal? Okay. So now he's talking about co compulsory volunteering mentioned in the previous. There's a transition from the previous that highlights the criticism of compulsory. Okay. So whatever the work may be, volunteer work is done willingly. That's, again, a way too wordy. I don't like that at all. I'm wondering in my mind, though, what's wrong with this? So there's a bunch of criticism about that we should have compulsory uh, against compulsory volunteerism by its very definition. Volunteer work is done willingly. I kind of like it. For many students, volunteer work is done as willingly. I don't know that that's the best transition for many students to go because we want to focus on a highlight of the criticism of compulsory volunteering. So now, fortunately for the communities in need, volunteer work, that's not a criticism. So there'll be no change in that one. By its very definition, volunteer work is done willingly. By requiring students to do community service in order to graduate, school officials are taking away students' choice to give up their time for nonprofit activities, making volunteerism less meaningful and pleasurable. You may have noticed, I hope you didn't, I hope you were reading, but you may have noticed that I smiled immediately because I know what they're going to ask us in this one. All right, let's talk about this use of the commas. And so I'm just going to go over really quickly um, as a review, I hope. So um, when it is S apostrophe, just like that, uh, we are talking about a bunch of people and they all own something. So it's plural possessive. There's a bunch of them. So there's a bunch of officials, but they would be owning something. There has to show possession for plural possession. In this case, I'm not sure that there's plural possession in there. There's a bunch of them. Sure. And when there's a bunch of them, then we just end it with an S, you know, dogs, cats, goats, um, and so there's just a bunch of them, kids. We just end it with an S. When they have to own something, though, that's when we do S apostrophe. In this case, I'm, I'm not seeing that they're owning anything. Okay. Are taking away students' choice. Now, I do like this one. S apostrophe. There's a bunch of kids. There's a bunch of students. They do have ownership of that choice to give up their time for nonprofit activities. Even though it's a non-tangible thing, um, you know, it's always easier when it's a very tangible thing that a bunch of people own, but you know, they're giving up their time. I do like this one, but as you see, I don't like this one. It's just a bunch of people that are taking away students' choice to give up their time for nonprofit activities. So I'm not gonna say no change, because again, no. So the very first thing I look at just to see if I can save some time is to see if um, any of them are keeping that plural possessive officials and they're not. So unfortunately we have to read through each one of them. Officials are taking away students. Now we already identify the fact that if there's a bunch of students, this is absolutely fine. However, the students do have ownership of their time. And so it would have to be S apostrophe. It would not be apostrophe S yes, because that would be singular possessive of one student. The official isn't just taking away one kid's use of their time. It's taking away all the kids. So it's not that one. So it's D. Plural possessive. According to a psychological concept theory, the loss of freedom in choosing an activity can cause a negative reaction. For instance, instead of focusing on the good they're doing, students may become resentful of the demands that compulsory volunteering places on their schedules. Proponents of compulsory volunteering who are in favor of it point out that it allows young people to garner the benefits of volu that volunteering offers. Okay, so... What they want to do is see how they can make this a little bit shorter, either by using punctuation, taking out words, or um, repeating themselves. So in this proponents of compulsory volunteering, advocating it, no, it's definitely not B. Proponents of compulsory volunteering 
Okay, so the reason, okay, so now I'm looking at, can it be just a singular volunteering? Proponents of proponents, people that like it, right? So people that like the idea of compulsory volunteering, people that are championing for uh, compulsory volunteering, um, we don't have to repeat that. So proponents of compulsory volunteering who are in favor of it, we don't have to say who are in favor of it because we already said proponents and proponents are always in favor of it. Um, so proponents of compulsory volunteering. So I do like C. And again, we wouldn't have to, who are in favor of it, if we're, we wouldn't have to change that if we just wanted to, you know, put in different words. Maybe if you want to step it up and say, and it's advocates, but that's not necessary in the sentence. So I'm going to take that one out. So I do like C. Proponents of compulsory volunteering who, sorry, proponents of compulsory volunteering point out that it allows young people to garner the benefits that volunteering offers. Students who volunteer report increased self-esteem, better ship better relationship building skills, and increasingly busy schedules. Ugh, no. Okay, so here's why I hate it. <laughs> um, here's our first one. So comma, our better increased self-esteem, that's a positive. Better relationship building skills, positive, and increasingly busy schedules. Well, that's the third one. So I do like that comma right there. However, that doesn't match. So the choice provides a supporting example that is most similar to the examples already in the sentence. I'm absolutely changing that. Uh, so we're looking for something positive because they kids have better self-esteem, better relationship building, a closer connection with their community. Absolutely. Less time spent engaging in social activities. That's another negative. Little increase in academic achievement. That's another negative. So we're absolutely going to go with B on that one. And... Most likely to volunteer. Okay, sorry. Some studies have also found that students who do community service are more likely to volunteer as adults and thus affect society positively um, over the course of many years. Sorry, I get excited. Okay, so we got to think about it like this. The way that this was used in the sentence is this one. So affect is always the verb. Effect is always the noun. So let's look at how it's used in the sentence. It's changing society positively, right? It's affecting, changing society positively. And I, I said affecting, it's doing something. So that word right there, like if we think about it, it is used in an action connotation in the sentence, affect. And so therefore, I'm going to pick this one. They always love to do affect and effect. Um, and it's that simple. It's just identifying, yeah, this is, you know, they're using it. How are they using it in the sentence? Are they using it as a verb? Are they using it as a noun? And that's as quick as you should be thinking about it. Like that's how, how deep you should be thinking about it. Are they using it as a verb or a noun? And if it's the verb, you pick the A. However, most research looks at students who volunteer in general, not making a distinction between students who are required to volunteer by their schools and those who volunteer willingly. One recent study by Sarah E. Helms, assistant professor of economics at Samford University in Birmingham, Alabama, did focus specifically on mandatory volunteering. Hmm. So now they're just saying, do we want to change that at all? Um... I really don't see a reason why they would change it. I guess most kids are going to think it's SAT and they're going to think it needs to be a more difficult word. Um, mandatory. These are all coercive, forcible, imperative. These are all synonyms. So because they're all synonyms and it makes sense and it's what the topic has been, I'm not going to change it. It's just not necessary. But every other student in the room is going to talk themselves into one of the other synonyms because it's SAT and they're going to think it has to be a, you know, a higher level vocabulary word. But um, we've studied before and we know that uh, SAT likes to use those lower level vocabulary words. She found that students who required to volunteer rushed to complete their service hours in early high school. What's the punctuation there? A comma, they then did significantly less 
regular volunteer work in the 12th grade than the service hours of those not required to volunteer. Okay, so what are we doing here in this sentence? And why are we asking about this punctuation? I looked over really quickly. It is a punctuation question. So the punctuation that's currently there is a comma. Let's see what, what would be better. It is a long sentence. She found that students who are required to volunteer rush to complete their service hours in early high school. That alone right there is a independent clause. It has a subject, it has a verb, it has a complete thought. So that could stand on its own. Let's see if the back half has an independent clause. They then did significantly less regular volunteer work in the 12th grade. Yeah, that is. Um, so a semicolon could work there. Okay, so no change. School, they then, there's no conjunction there. There's absolutely no reason why they would add in a comma right there. None. School, period. Yes, you could absolutely put a period there. However, it wouldn't be a they, comma, then, because this isn't a, um, we're not, using they as a transition word. It's just they then did significantly less regular volunteer work in 12th grade. So that comma right there makes it uh, incorrect. And as we mentioned, you definitely could break this up. They are two independent clauses. Yes, this absolutely would work there. Okay, so then the back half. Then they, they then did significantly less regular volunteer work in the 12th grade than the service hours of those not required to volunteer. Than these service hours. Okay, so we're using, um, if you think about it in a math term, we are looking at like two different groups of students. She found that students who are required to volunteer rushed to complete their service hours in early high school. They then did significantly less regular volunteer work in 12th grade than the service hours of those not required to volunteer. Okay, so we're going to look for maybe something a little less wordy than the service hours of those. Then did students who were, okay, than did students who were, yes, then hours worked by students, and now that's passive voice. Um, 12th grade compared with students. This is the same word as compared. We don't need to change that. So significantly less work, volunteer work in the 12th grade than did students who were not required to volunteer. Than, yeah. Again, repetitive. Than did students who were. Helms concluded that compulsory volunteering does not necessarily create lifelong volunteers. Instead of requiring students to volunteer, schools have to recognize that not all students are equally well suited to the same activities. That doesn't even make sense. We're talking about volunteering. We're not talking about compulsory volunteer practice or volleyball practice. Instead of requiring students to volunteer, students have to recognize that not all students are equally well suited to the same activities. So which choice most effectively sets the point in the next sentence? Many studies show that when students simply tell stu schools simply tell students about opportunities for community service and connect them with organizations that need help, more students volunteer their own free will. So we are going to change that because I don't like that at all. Instead of requiring students to volunteer, schools should allow students to spend their time participating in athletics and other extracurricular activities. And we're still talking about volunteering, though. Instead of requiring students to volunteer, schools should focus on offering arrangements that make volunteering an easy and attractive choice. That's about volunteering. Instead of requiring schools Schools, students to volunteer, schools are advised to recognize the limits of their ability to influence their students. No. Should focus. Instead of requiring students to volunteer, schools should focus on offering arrangements that make volunteering an easy and attractive choice. Many studies show that when schools simply tell students so, the writer wants a conclusion that states the main claim of the passage, which choice best accomplishes this goal. 
It is imperative that school students do their part to find volunteers for the many work. Mm, no, schools fine. Schools should not be finding the volunteers. Schools that do this will, okay, many studies show that when schools simply tell students about opportunities for community service and connect them with organizations that need help, more students volunteer their own free will. Schools that do this will produce more engaged, enthusiastic volunteers that schools that, than schools that require volunteer work. Yes, yes, that's the main topic. Um, Studies in the field of psychology and economics have revolution researchers' understanding of volunteerism. No, never talked about it. It is important that students choose charitable work that suits their interests and values. I choose B all day long. Interesting. Okay. So that was the conclusion. So now we're on to our next one. So on that one, we had a chance to look at a semicolon again. Marsupials lend a hand to science. Marsupials, mammals that carry their young in a pouch, are a curiosity among biologists because they lack a corpus colossum, the collective of nerve fibers collecting the two, connecting the two hemispheres of the brain. In other mammals, in most other mammals, the left hemisphere of the brain controls the right side of the body. And the right hemisphere controls the left, and the corpus callosum allows communication between the hemispheres. How interesting. Mammals and marsupials, because they lack that. Okay, I'm rereading it because I want to make sure I have a good understanding. Marsupials, mammals that carry a young in a pouch, are, cur are a curiosity among biologists because they lack a corpus callosum. Uh, the collection of nerve fibers connecting the two hemispheres of the brain. In most other animals, the left hemisphere of the brain controls the right side of the body and the right hemisphere controls the left. And the corpus callosum allows communication between the two hemispheres. That's interesting. So the marsupials don't have communication between the two sides. Scientists are long believing. Okay, so here we already go with some subject verb agreement. Um, scientists will long be believing now. Have long believed, yes, long believe, have long believed that the structure enables complex tasks by sequestering skill movement to a single hemisphere without sacrificing coordination between both sides of the body. Interesting. And notice, correct use of a semicolon. This sequestration, sequestration would explain handedness, the tendency to prefer one hand over the other in humans. Okay, so here's an interesting thing I just want to point out to you because I was talking about the appositives. So again, here's another good use of an appositive. So comma. So again, I'm just like in love with these commas and semicolons. Um, the, sequestra the sequestration would explain handedness, comma, the tendency to consistently prefer one hand over the other, comma, in humans, we could get rid of this um, a positive, and we could just say the se sequestration would explain handedness in humans, and that would be great. However, the comma, comma helps us understand a little bit more about that. However, it looks like we have to uh, change something up a little bit here. Um, one hand over another. That's why as I'm looking, I'm kind of like thinking, I don't think there was anything in particular wrong because when I read it, I would have said it to you and I didn't say anything. So I don't think there's really anything wrong. Um, one hand over the other. So um, we would prefer and favor the use of one hand over the other. Prefer and favor are synonyms. So why am I going to add on and favor? So no, we don't want to make it more wordy. Uh, would prefer one hand over the other that could not be chosen. That doesn't even make sense. How many hands do they have? Uh, prefer one hand on a regular basis. Just keep it as one hand or the other. However, a recent finding in handedness in marsupials suggests that a trait or other, oh, sorry, a trait, other than the presence of a corpus callosum, links as handedness bipedalism. Okay, so let's go back up. We're on 25. That a trait, 
other than the presence of a corpus callosum. I don't see why we would have to add in any. We don't have to add in any, any punctuation there. It's a trait other than the presence of corpus callosum. There's no reason why we would have to add on any type of punctuation there. Links as handedness. Okay, so again, links as correlates with, correlates from, or links on. I guess the one thing that I don't like is the verb links as handedness. So um, I am going to make a change. Trait other than the presence of links. I wish I could just get uh, rid of the as. Just say links handedness by pedalism, but that's not one of my options over here, unfortunately. So um, we do have a synonym correlates with handedness, and I like that. Correlates from, no, that doesn't make sense. Cor links on doesn't even make sense. So correlates with handedness by pedalism. I kind of always liked, this is weird. I've always been a little interested in bipedalism. I just always think that's like such a cool word and I always want to read more about that. So yay, we get to read more. Researchers at State University, State University, and the University of Tasmania observed marsupials walking on either two legs, bipeds, or four quadrupeds and performing tasks such as bringing food to their mouths. The scientists employed a mean handedness index. Okay, and so this, the, um, uh, sorry, the um, colon is telling us, here's more information about this mean handedness in index. Negative scores indicated a left forelimb presence and positive scores indicated a right forelimb presence. Okay, as I'm thinking, I'm thinking like the, the punctuation is perfect in here. I don't see anything grammarly problem. Diplomatic. So let's have a look. Which choice acutely, accurately, accurately reflects the information in the graph? Oh, it's a graph. Remember, I told you there's some graphs. Okay, so I'll read it to you while you're looking at this. Essentially, what we have is left forelimb presence, zero to point five. Right forelimb presence, and then we have. bipedal marsupials okay so what the actual the initial reading was i guess i'll zoom out a little bit so we can read it together the initial reading was negative scores indicated a left forelimb preference that's not true negative scores indicated a right forelimb presence okay so now i see what the question is asking us Scores of zero or less indicated a left forelimb presence. No, zero or less were right. Positive scores indicated a lack of forelimb presence. No, that's not true. They liked left forelimb presence. Positive scores indicated a left forelimb presence and negative scores indicated a right forelimb. Yeah, T is correct. Easy. While eating, the eastern gray kangaroo, red neck wallaby, red kangaroo, and there's a comma there. That comma shouldn't be there. Now again, let's just, uh, I'm going to waste time here and remind you. We have three. One, two, three, four. So we have to do, you know, the comma before. The conjunction and this is a comma after the conjunction and and that can't be like that so the weird thing is that B is repeating itself so we have to have a change B is repeating itself um, it's not gonna we're not gonna break it up with that oh B is not repeating itself that's so stupid I'm sorry comma, and, so that's my rule, comma, and, and it's not con kangaroo, dash, and, like, this is a lot right here, a uh, dash, an and, a conjunction, and a comma, no, so con kangaroo, and, so it's going to be, while eating, the eastern 
gray kangaroo, comma, redneck wallaby, comma, red kangaroo, comma, and brush tail batong. Yes. All by super mar- marsupials, bipedal marsupials preferred using their left forelimb as revealed by positive mean handedness index values less than 0.2. Nobody's positive mean handedness were less than 0.2. On all four. On all four, they were over 0.5. So that's not true. Positive mean handedness value index values less than 0.02. Positive mean handedness indi- greater than 0.6. That's not true for all of them. Positive mean handedness index values between 0.4 and 0.6. That's true for all of them. Mean handedness values of zero. No. So let's see. Having four feet. I'm already going to look over there. This is a weird transition. Which choice provides the best transition from the previous paragraph? Yeah. No, I don't like having four feet. Quadrupedal, quadrupedal marsupials in the study did not show a strong preference for the use of one forelimb. Okay, so I'm definitely making a change. It is not true that is most like most other mammals. We don't have any... We don't have any um, uh, evidence of that. Um, and quadrupedal marsupials on the study did not show a strong preference for the use of one forelimb. In contrast with their bipedal counterparts, which we just read, they did. So I do like see while using their forelimbs for eating. No. Oh my gosh. In contrast with their bipedal counterparts, quadrupedal Pedal marsupials in the study did not show a strong preference for the use of one forelimb. For instance, gray short-tailed opossums and sugar gliders were assigned mean handedness values very close to zero. They used their right and left forelimbs nearly equally. In effect, the study provided no evidence of handedness among quadrupedal marsupials. Kangaroos, though, still do not exhibit handedness to the extent that humans do. As the researchers noted, the quadrupedals, quadrupeds typically live in trees and apply all four limbs in climbing. The bipeds on the hands are far less, which put main claim of the passage. Kangaroos, those, st- okay, so the main claim of the passage is that it's not, the main claim is not that kangaroos still do not exhibit handedness to the extent that humans do. For the marsupials in the study, then, handedness seems to be associated with bipedalism. What's, no. Um, there are many things scientists do not understand about the marsupial brain. Actually, that's kind of how they started off talking about the marsupial brain, right? They were talking about how it doesn't have the corpus callosum. Additional studies in this phenomenon will need to be performed with other mammals. I, I like that because I'm th- it's making me think of the science and all the SAT science readings. However, that's not the main claim of the, of the passage. There are many things that scientists do not understand is how they started this passage. So I'm going to go there. As the researchers noted, the quadrupeds typically live in trees and employ all four limbs in climbing. The bipeds, on the other hand, are far less arboreal leaving their forelimbs relatively free for tasks in whom. That doesn't even make any sense. Tasks in whom. All right, so whom is what we talk about when we have no idea who the subject is. We have absolutely no idea who the subject is. I was just reading in a book, and they did say um, for whom. And it was used so beautifully. It's so rarely used because typically an author does give us an introduction to the subject, but if we have absolutely no idea who the subject is, then we use whom. In this one, we know who the subject is, so that doesn't make any sense. Um, leaving their forelimbs relatively free for tasks in, when I'm reading it, I'm thinking in which, when I'm just reading it, I'm thinking in which handedness may confer an evolutionary advantage. 
why the majority of marsupials studied prefer their left forelimbs while the majority of humans prefer their right remains a mystery, however, as does the mechanism by which, comma, in the absence of a corpus callosum, the hemispheres of the marsupial brain communicate. The writer wants to communicate, conclude the passage by recalling a topic from the first paragraph that requires additional research. He did, they he actually did do that, um, but he says, which choice accomplishes this goal? The researchers should not neglect the sizable majority of humans who are left-handed. That's um, when he's bringing it back. That's what he does. He does do that. So I want to say no change. Um, scientists believe that studies like this one may someday yield insights to the causes of certain neurological disorders that, again, is thinking about what are they going to do next. And that wasn't brought up in the first of the the first paragraph. So I don't like that one. An additional study is planned to study handedness. And again, that wasn't brought up in the first paragraph. So I'm going to go no change. An employee benefit that benefits employers. Interesting. Benefits employers. According to 2014 report from the Society for Human Resource Management, According to a 2014 report from the Society for Human Resource Management, 54% of surveyed companies provide tuition assistance to employees pursuing an undergraduate degree, and 50% do so for employees working toward their graduate degree. The reason why I just reread this was how does that benefit employers? Despite these findings, more companies should consider helping employees pay for education because doing so, all right, already I don't know, like this transition. So which choice provides the most effective transition from the previous sentence? So in addition to the 2014 report, no. More companies should help? No. And I am definitely making a change. Although those levels are impressive, more companies should consider helping employees pay for education. I like that. Whether they want to or not, no, I don't like that. So although those levels are impressive, more companies should consider helping employees pay for education because doing so helps increase customer satisfaction. Which choice most effectively establishes the main idea of the passage? Increases customer satisfaction and improves the quality of the company's business. Okay, so again, it's benefiting employers. We're paying for employees going back to school, tuition assistance. Although the levels are impressive, more companies should help employees pay for education. And in doing so, I don't think we're going to increase customer satisfaction. Solve the, I don't think we're going to solve the problem of rising tuition costs. I don't think it's going to strengthen the economy. We can attract and retain employees, thus benefiting the employer. Helps attract and retain employees and improve the quality of the company's business. That fits in perfectly. Tuition reimbursement programs signal that employers offer their workers opportunities. So as we've gone through before, I do think that there's just a bunch of workers that have opportunities. I don't think the re signals that employers offer their workers opportunities. I'm looking over here. It's definitely not opportunities showing possession a bunch of workers and a bunch of opportunities for personal and professional growth. I like that one. It's not one worker and the opportunities is not possessive. So tuition reimbursement programs signal that employers offer their workers. Employers are giving the workers an opportunity. The employers are giving workers opportunities. The workers don't have possession of anything. The employers are giving them opportunities, and therefore, I'll pick C. 
business community. Oh, sorry, I'm going to go back. According to Professor Management Peter Capelli, such opportunities are appealing to highly motivated and disciplined individuals and may attract applicants with these desirable qualities. Many in the business community concur. Explaining his company's decision to expand its tuition assistance program, John Fox, the director of dealer training at Fiat Chrysler Automotive in the United States, I don't like that. <laughs> so it could just be stressed. It's not stressing. And he stressed. Stressed the importance of drawing skilled employees to Fiat Chrysler's car dealerships. This is a benefit that can surely bring top talent to our dealers, he said. Paying for tuition also helps businesses retain employees. Retaining employees, the only thing that I kind of am thinking as we're going on this one is that um, we, why do we have to re repeat retain employees, retain employees? So here's retain employees, retain employees. So I'm thinking like there's something up with this one and they're going to have us combine sentences at the underlined portion. Okay. So paying for tuition also helps businesses retain employees is important, not only because it ensures a skilled and enforced workforce, but also because it mitigates the considerable cost of finding, hiring, and training new workers. Okay. Paying for tuition also helps businesses retain employees. And this retention, again, it's this word right here. I can't do that. We can't have it repeated right there. Paying for tuition also helps businesses retain employees, the, re uh, the retention of whom, and it wouldn't be whom because we know that the subject is the employees. Um, retain employees, which is important, not only retaining employees, which is important, not only because it mitigates the considerable cost of finding, hiring, and training new workers. Yep. And it wouldn't be, um, a semicolon because that would be isn't pay for tuition all the original employees that is important not only because it ensures a skilled employee but that it also but also it mitigates considerable cost of funding hiring and training new workers so between those two let me see Employees whose tuition is reimbursed often stay with their employer even after they complete their degrees, period, because. So I guess they want to bring those together because their new qualification is given the opportun opportunities for advancement within the company. So it would just be degrees. It's not, they're not going on to list or give us like incredibly important information. Degrees because, degrees, but your degrees, degrees because. No punctuation is necessary. Employees whose tuition is reimbursed often stay with their employer even after they complete their degrees because their new qualifications, because it's, all, it's like used as a conjunction there and it's there's no necessary, we don't have to have... Um, any punctuation to bring those two sentences together. Their new qualifications give the opportunities for advancement within the company. The career of Valerie Lincoln, an employee at aerospace company, United Technologies Corporation, in parentheses, UTC. So um, if you haven't learned that before, when you introduce uh, you know, a, a proper name and then you give the um, abbreviated version of it in you can do it in parentheses after you introduce the proper name and then give the abbreviated version in parentheses. Then you can use the parentheses version for the rest of the time that you're uh, referring back to that, that company or that proper name. Um, so let's see what's going on here. I may have to look back here. The career of Valerie Lincoln, comma, an employee at the aerospace company United Technologies corporation and then in parentheses UGC is significant okay so what they did here was they added in an a positive um, remember the positive is comma more information than you need but the author wants you to know it 
So we very well could, um, you know, take it out. However, what they forgot to do was to put in that comma at the end of the appositive. So the career of Valerie Lincoln, comma, an employee at the aerospace company United Technologies Corporation, UTC, comma, is a significant success story for her company's tuition reimbursement program. And the reason why I know that works is because, remember, you can take out that appositive and the sentence still makes sense. So it would be the career of Valerie Lincoln is a significant success story for her company's tuition reimbursement program. That's perfect. It has a subject, a verb, and a complete thought, but we got that appositive information in there and it told us what UTC was. United Technologies Corporation. In eight years at UTC, Lincoln earned associate and it earned associate and bachelor's degrees in business and advanced from administrative assistant position to an accounting associate position. This allowed UTC to retain an employee with a deep knowledge of her industry and years of valuable experience. I guess what they want to do is say, is there anything better, a word better than deep? And so what we're going to look first is just to see if there's any synonyms because oftentimes you guys have seen already um the synonyms that's not and that doesn't even make sense that she would she would go places with her hidden knowledge in her, of her industry her large knowledge is a synonym with deep and spacious maybe but there's no reason to change her deep knowledge of her industry and years of valuable experience tuition reimbursement can be expensive and many companies would find it impractical to pay for multiple degrees for all employees. Businesses have succeeded in minimizing and keeping down costs. Again, they're going through and they're telling us the same word, synonyms, minimizing and keeping down costs. So let's just change that. And ensuring the relevance of employees' coursework by offering fixed amounts of reimbursement each year and stipulating which subjects. I'm just going to read ahead because the sentence is really long. Workers can study. Okay. So we're on this one. So we have to just get rid of minimizing and keeping down. Businesses have succeeded in minimizing costs associated with employees' coursework. It's just, we can get rid of the minimizing part. Keeping down costs and ensuring the relevance of employees' Prevalence of employees' coursework by offering fixed amounts of reimbursement each year and stipulating which subjects workers can study. Even those methods, tuition, even with those methods, tuition reimbursement may not be appropriate in all cases, especially if classes are likely to divert employees' time. Are likely to divert. I don't see any reason why we have to change anything. Subject, verb matches classes are likely to divert employees time and energy from their jobs to make this most logical the sentence should be placed at immediately after the last sentence and paragraph okay so tuition reimbursement may not be appropriate in all cases especially if classes are likely to divert employees time and energy from their jobs i guess my first thought is i don't think there's anything really wrong with where it is right now so just really quickly, if I was out of time, I would say no change, and I'd say it's perfectly fine because this first one, many companies should um, consider helping employees pay for education because, and it's good, it's all it's a good, um, all positive things about doing it. And this sentence, even with these methods, tuition, especially if class are likely to divert employees. We're looking, this is like a negative um, so paragraph one is all positive. So now, uh, let's see more boys off their work. I'm looking to see if this is a positive or a negative connotation in paragraph two. No, it's all positive. So I definitely wouldn't put that there in paragraph three. Paying for tuition also helps businesses retain Employees, retaining employees is, is important not only because it ensures this come. It's all positive, so I'd say keep it where it is. At the end of paragraph four. And that's the end of our grammar. All right, I'm going to post a list of um, things to really consider and to remember, but um, 
if you really paid attention and did this with me, you probably got everything you need to do to do really, really well in the grammar section. 35 minutes, 44 questions. Let's go.